Hi everyone and welcome to Legal Limelight where we talk about all things intellectual property and we shine the light on thought leaders in the legal industry and entrepreneurs that are using their IP to inspire others, share their mission and create wealth. Super excited. We have an awesome guest today, Raquel Garcia, who, hey, I just saw her join. We're going to bring you up. Hey guys, good to see you. Okay, just added. So, hi, Santos Legal Group. Hey! Hi! <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Hello from Lisbon. <laughs> yeah, so I just, I just saw um, that you. And we're going to dig, you know, we're going to go into your whole background, but right now you're currently in Europe. Yes, I am working remotely. So, yeah. Got to love that remote working life. <laughs> <laughs> it is. How lucky we are. I mean, how lucky we are that the pandemic has sort of made this sort of normal to not be stuck in an office Monday to Friday. So I thought I'd jump at the chance. But yeah, we'll, we'll elaborate on that a bit later. <laughs> it's so it's so great. And it's nice to finally meet you in person. <laughs> exactly right. Like we talked on the phone, we've emailed, like we've, we worked in a matter together, which we actually won. I'm really excited about that. But um, yeah, so it's really exciting. I'm really excited to see you face to face, kind of. I think that goes to the power of the internet and the virtual world. Like you can, you can really build real relationships and client business relationships through the internet. It's really fascinating. Exactly right. Like a literal intercontinental sort of relationship. Oh, well, Raquel, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm really excited to, to get started. But before we do, I want to give everyone um, your bio. So sure. Raquel is an Australia and New Zealand qualified trademark attorney, and she's the founder of Legiterati, a law firm that creates and protects brands. She is an ex, I love this, ex old law, top tier in Australia, attorney turned full-time fitness professional. She founded Legiterati during the pandemic and the Melbourne lockdowns. Really excited. Um, I have so much I want, I literally like took notes. I have so much I want to talk to you about. We keep these short, so let's just jump right in. Um, sure. I want to talk about your pivot because you know, being an ex-old law, full-time fitness professional to starting your own law firm, what was it that inspired you to build and create Legiterati? Sure. So um, just to sort of backtrack. So um, in Australia, um, if you, when you go to law school, um, pretty much literally the first day, they get, you get, it, it gets drilled in your head that the only way that you'd be successful in the legal industry is to get into um, the big six law firms. So that's, they're called the top tier law firms. I think they're called um, the magic circle in the UK. I'm not sure what the USA counterpart is, but so um, being, exactly. So law students being, you know, being the, com be, being the competitive people that we are. So from day one, we're like, okay, that's the goal. You know, um, so the way to get to that is to get into a clerkship in one of these firms on your third year of law school. Um, so that was pretty much my goal. I had my blinkers on from day one um, of law and I was able to do that. I did everything by the book. Um, you know, I, I got a clerkship. I even um, became proactive about it in that I didn't... Um, I didn't wait until my third year to, you know, apply for a clerkship. I thought, you know what, second year I'm going to apply for a paralegal um, sort of position in one of these firms. And I did that. And that really helped me um, go through the clerkship process. And the only way that you can get a graduate position in a law firm is um, be one of their clerks from, you know, uh, previous intake. So I did all that by the book. Um, I... Um, I got my um, first job pretty much in trademarks from day one in intellectual property, and I really loved it so much. So I did that. So I did everything by the book, um, did that for about um, four years. And towards the four years, towards the end of the four years uh, of me um, working in that top tier law firm, I discovered fitness. So I would go to the gym, just really loved it. And one day I was just approached by one of the managers of the gym and said, Raquel, you're really good at this. Have you thought about teaching? So I did my research as to how to get qualified to just teach on the side, um, like a paid hobby. So I, I took like, like six months to a year, a year to do that. Um, got trained, got... Um, Certified, so I yeah started teaching Pilates, um, spin on the side. So I would 
pretty much um, teach Pilates and spin either before work or after work or after hours. And I really loved it so much. So I did that for about um, a year and a half or two years. And I really loved it so much that um, the thought came to me that, hey, why should I? Why, but maybe I should try doing this full time. Like I'm not gonna turn my back um, on law completely, but um, while I was still, you know, fit, relatively young, maybe I should do this full time while I still um, have the opportunity. So I did um, like a transition plan, like a two year transition plan in which, you know, I would slowly transition from law to fitness full time. And then this amazing opportunity came up to lead um, the group fitness department of a gym chain here um, in Melbourne. So, and I got that really early. So that two year transition plan happened really early. So I found myself working in fitness full-time um yeah teaching lots of classes um at the same time and that was my life um and I never really saw myself going back to law because I really loved fitness I was you know I was making a name in the industry um so and that I did that for about um three years full time and then um, COVID happened. Mm. So as you know, um, you know, gyms closed. Um, so suddenly from, you know, being active pretty much six days of the week to nothing, being stuck in the house. Yeah, um, yeah so, um, so that sort of made me reassess what I want to do um, moving forward. So I thought maybe this is the time that I go back to um, doing law again. So um, I got my qualifications back and um, I got a job at um, a pretty much an old school firm again. And then I realized that I don't want to do old school law anymore. So this is um, this is actual this actually in Australia. I'm not sure about the US. This is this is sort of like movement of new law in which um, millennial um, lawyers are pretty much starting their own firms, um, doing things, pretty much rebelling against old law and that we don't do um, you know um, hourly rates. We give fixed fee rates. We um, pretty much. We don't overpromise, but we over deliver all of these things. Um, and I'm not sure if um, you've mentioned it, um, but I also have a candle brand um, mm. called um, Glow Candy. And in starting that, I really love the um, the branding process. And I met so many people in like the entrepreneur community in Australia. And from there. Um, in that sort of network, I found many people um, coming to me with um, brand protection advice. And then I realized that um, these entrepreneurs have all, they had, they had this impression of getting a trademark or just even getting your um, ideas protected was something really intimidating to do in that they don't know how to approach big law firms to help them protect their um, intellectual property. So I thought, I'm onto something here. Maybe yes. this is like my my ideal um, target market. So I did my research, did a business plan, and um, I, I wasted no time. So I pretty much saved up money to start everything up. Did the branding, got the company re um, registered, and all that. Um, I did I did a beta stage in that um, I trialed some trademark filings with you know um, people in my business community, and then when I became like really confident to like roll it out, I officially launched Literati. So this was, um, I think, so in Melbourne, we had about five lockdowns. I launched Literati um, on our third lockdown. So that was one of the really, really long ones. So that was in November um, 2020. So um, yeah, we launched in November 2020. We rolled it out. And yeah, I'm actually surprised as to how quickly it became so successful in that, you know, um, a lot of my leads are now pretty much um, word of mouth from, you know, people in the entrepreneur, um, small business community. So, yeah, so from that, this is how I pivoted. And yeah, this is where I am now. It's so amazing. And what I love now hearing your story from, you know, from yourself directly, I yes. can tell that you always thought outside of the box. Yes. You were always passionate. You had more going on and you did have, uh, you had a little bit of creativity that law school doesn't teach. Exactly right. And I think um, this is why I also was attracted to trademarks and that there was um, a lot of creativity sort of elements in, in trademarking in that 
um, it's not just about, you know, filing. It's all about strategy and all of these things that you don't really find in other areas of law, like, you know, tax and things like that. So um, this is why I've always practiced in trademarks, really. I, <laughs> I don't know anything else to do <laughs> apart from trademarks. And even, even sometimes there's the trademark attorneys, they realize that don't think outside the box. I just had a client who's actually like a big EU company come to me because as a, for a second opinion because their trademark lawyers that are actually at a, like a, a pretty big firm told them no this is high risk you shouldn't enter the US market okay <laughs> this is like this is an EU brand with makes hundreds of million dollars a year and their lawyers are telling them no don't enter the US market it's high risk like what in what world do you think that that's good legitimate good advice um what you're supposed to do is tell the client this is this is the risk and you figure out the business decision okay and if it's if it's a risk you're willing to take and then the attorney's goal is to figure out how to diminish that risk so just exactly. because something looks unavailable you can approach someone for consent. You can do a deal with them. You can, there's things you can do. And so um, it's really, I love that word you use with strategy and um, thinking about how to get a brand. And I feel like that was a similar situation to how you came to me, where you had a client that had a name that was kind of similar and we had to figure out what to do. Exactly right. So um, yes, and um, you know, instead of me saying, oh, someone's already filed the exact same trademark. You should just give up. You should just rebrand. We found out that it was actually a trademark squatter and we were able to oppose them successfully because we had evidence. Yeah, so, yeah, I agree with you. Um, a lot of lawyers, um, and sh um, shamefully, trademark lawyers, they have, they're very risk-averse in that they're very black and white about things, but, yeah, they don't think it's outside the box. They don't think about opportunities. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Sometimes I, I catch myself. I'm like, I, 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 I really catch myself um, where someone says something and my immediate reaction, because this is how we're trained, is to say, no, this is too risky, or they're not really probably going to use it as a trademark. But then, you know, you take a step back and think, what's the goal? What's the objective? Can the client begin to use it as a trademark? Maybe it, if, if it was an element that was either too descriptive or um, just a title, can they do things to actually create a brand around them? So that's kind of... Um, where like my sweet spot is is that and it sounds like it that's yours too is like the strategy piece yeah absolutely and apart from strategy it's all about really caring for your clients and really want to see them succeed so um i've got another um us um trademark as well that i'm showing where my client well there's a mark that um uh, you know, uh, a previously filed mark in the US that's been cited against my client and um yeah, so I really dove deep into the history of my client's trademark and it turned out that my client has been using um, their trademark literally decades before this um, previously cited mark. So now we're in the process of cancelling it in the US because my client has this pretty much, you know, um, senior right, as you would call it in the US. So, um, and I found that... Um, I've got other clients who went through U.S. attorneys as well who never really okay. investigate as to what the background is and all that. They just said, oh, yeah, it's been um, filed before you. It's hopeless. Uh, like, n no. If anyone is an attorney, <laughs> like, listen to this, <laughs> or um, your client and your attorney says yeah. that, that if, if you get a no, that's when you need a second opinion. So for example, when we get that, it happened today where um, it was a higher risk mark. So then I literally, I have an attack, I have an attack cheat sheet where we look, number one, go online. Does it look like they're using it? Number two, when is their maintenance date? Can we, can we um, wait to see if they're gonna file the renewal? Or number three, um, look at the specimen. Maybe they they submitted a fake specimen. There's all of these things I have because um, I have like a procedures document that yes. I built. I built to um, remind me and go through those things because um, it there is that is the difference between an average attorney and a an, an excellent one. I really believe that.
Yes, I totally agree. And I feel like um, only attorneys like us who really care about our clients and their success actually d deep dive into things like that rather than just say, no. Yeah, and I'm really glad we were able to, to, to yes. help your client. <laughs> and yes. it wasn't that Me expensive. Too. Not at all. So um, it wasn't expensive at all because we knew we had a strong case. So, um, yeah, I'm really happy that um, we pursued that. And that's like kind of where I try to, I try to talk about this in my content money, really, because um, it's important where I want people to understand what the costs, what the costs really are, because they get freaked out sometimes and think, oh, well, it's going to cost me tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. So then yes. they don't do anything and they wait until there's a major problem. And I tell them at that point, like, do you agree, Raquel, at that point? Yes. Is, is it expensive? Right. And I think it, this goes back to um, how I discovered that um, um, small business owners have always have this impression in their head that getting a trademark, um, protecting their brand and IP is a very expensive sort of endeavor. So they don't go through it or even do like a, s such a simple thing um, and a relatively cheap thing, relatively cheap thing such as uh, a trademark search because they think it would cost them, you know, $10,000. So whenever I do discovery calls with my clients, they're mainly, as I said, small to, be, um, small to medium um, business owners. They get so surprised as to how cheap it is. Um, like it's no, it's by no means cheap, but they have this impression that it's like tens of thousands of dollars to get a trademark. So that's why a lot of, a lot of them forego it. Yeah, that's so. why, that's why we have these conversations. And it, I'm really like excited to see what's happening in the legal industry. People like us who are on just educating business owners to understanding like what it actually costs and why it's important. Yeah. And we're making the law accessible. It's not like this, you know, kind of like very similar to glass ceiling in that, you know, they think it's a something that they can't achieve, but it's actually accessible to them. You just need the right person to communicate the message to them and give them the tools and I the access to, to the law. Well, you're doing, you're doing a great job. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we connected on Instagram. This is, this is where we connected, right? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I really love your content. So when this opposition matter came up, you're the first person that I thought of because, you know, your message really resonated with me and the way you communicate is the way I pretty much communicate to my clients. Mm -hmm. So we don't do like do the formal sort of emailing. We do lots of emojis. Like I, I encourage them to talk to me like, you know, how they would talk to someone in real life. You know, if there's like a, a word that they don't know because it's a jargon in the legal world, I just, you know, encourage them to like say it in a, in a layman term. So, um, yeah, and that's pretty much, and as I said, that's how you communicate um, through your social media and it really resonates with me. I, you know, that was like a very hard um, thing to accept because I think as lawyers, we're almost taught to feel like we have to sound sophisticated and use fancy words. And then when you hear someone speaking that way, your immediate reaction is, wow, like that person knows a lot and I don't know anything. And then you feel bad about yourself. I've, real, I've come to accept that if that person's speaking if I can't understand them, it's not me. That person is doing a bad job. That person is actually doing a bad job at communicating. And a lot of really good attorneys take the time to speak, even though they may be extremely intelligent, they take the time to communicate in a way that people can actually understand. And so I have really taken that in, into my uh, practice and speaking and writing in a way where I am, of course, ad advocating, but I understand it so well that I can now translate it uh, naturally and easily into easy to understand terms. Yes, absolutely. And I think it goes back to that um, mission of, you know, providing access to the law. Yes, yes. yes legalese you make you make law approachable to business owners and you open a whole different market because you make it accessible to them i love that you mentioned mission because i have here 
that your mission is to make brand protection accessible to startup founders and small business owners, as well as elevating underrepresented groups such as women and um, and also minority founders. So that's amazing. Can you talk talk a little bit about what you're what you actually um, are doing in that space? Yes. Yeah, so um, I do pro bono work for. Women of color business owners as well as indigenous um, business owners. So um, yeah, so instead of me um, charging my professional rates for um, filing their trademarks and giving them preliminary advice, I pretty much you know forego that and just charge them the government fees. So I do a set amount of um, pro bono work that I do for yeah women of color and um, indigenous as well, and. Um, when I um, hire uh, my graphic designers and my um, freelance trademark attorneys, I think outside the box. Like, you know, I don't just um, advertise on, you know, um, job sites, things like that. I go into law schools, um, you know, look at people who look like me, people who um, I can put in a position where someone who's, I don't know, 10 years old, um, Asian girl in a school who think, oh, yeah, I can't do that. You know, they have someone to look up to. So, so yeah, because um, I would say that um, law in Australia is still very white, um, female, not, not female, male dominated. And this, this, a, there's some, um, there's a good equality sort of ratio between male and female in, in the legal industry in Australia. But um, under the surface, um, that 50% female is mainly um, white women. Wow. And, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so if I can sort of like um, portray this image of the law um, that it is accessible not just for small business owners, but, you know, women of color, in the, people of indigenous background to actually try that, then it's all worth it. I love that. And it is important to see, you want to see people who look like you in those professions and and in, in in those roles that's why it's really important to have diversity i fundamentally believe that exactly so um yeah and i think i think we're getting there slowly in australia um but it takes proactive people to actually sort of like accelerate that progress so in the u.s um i I, I do a lot of mentoring for law students and I realized I was saying the same thing over and over on the phone because I was a first generation and um, I don't know, I just, I really embrace my personality and authenticity through it. Um, and so I want to encourage other young females to do the same. So I created a program that's called Law School Mastermind. It's a whole little mini course and for any of the law students watching, um, it, it I think there's skills that are transferable to anyone. So even like Australia, Australia law students, uh, it's, it's free. It, they're free videos on my, on my site. If you go to law school mastermind, so that's how like I try to give. Yeah. Back. And share that with my, um, yeah. People from law school that I, you know, stay in contact with. Thank you. Yeah. I think the more that we do and the more that we give back, then like we're inspiring that next generation. It's so, it's amazing, Raquel. Like I, I loved working with you as a client and I love <laughs> your mission. Um, I think it's so cool with your fitness background and also the business glow candy. So um, before we wrap up, can, we, can you leave everyone with one point of advice? Um, one point of advice. Um, I think we've touched on this. Think outside the box. Um, don't be afraid to, so the way, I'm not sure how the US, well, you, law schools in the US work, um, in that in Australia, as I said, they, from day one, you, they tend to want to put you in this sort of cookie cutter, sort of like um, path through the law. And it's the same with the way of thinking. You need to stay by the book, things like that. So I guess one piece of advice is to, um, for you to like for everyone really to think outside the box um don't just like it's good to stay with you know the principles of the law but as i said that's old school law you know it's a new sort of world now this don't be afraid to make your mark and um yeah think outside the box and you, if you have an idea just go for it doesn't matter what it is business whatever even just you know working remotely it's, and if, if it scares you but if it feels right just go for it 
I love that. And it was <laughs> so amazing to have you. Where can people find Glow Candy, your candle company? Um, yes. Um, so we're mainly more active on Instagram. So we're um, at Glow underscore, oh, sorry, Glow underscore Candy. And we're also on glowcandy.com.au. Amazing. And then where can people find you for your amazing legal services? Yes, so we're on Um and we're also um, on Instagram, so we're just at Legiderati. Amazing. Raquel, thank you so much for coming on, and I hope it's we get to meet really in person at some point soon. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll be stopping by the U.S. at some point during my travels, so yeah, I would love to meet Let you. me know. I'm right by yeah. New York City. Yes, absolutely. Okay, everyone. Thank you again for coming on Legal Limelight. We'll see you back next week. Bye, everyone. Yeah.